What's up guys? Welcome to the Ants Canada Ant Channel. I'm your Ant Guy, Mikey Bustos. Thanks for watching this video. It really means a lot to me. I've been wanting to release this video for a while. <sighs> Sorry, there's my pig. Don't mind her walking around in the background there. Over the years that Ants Canada has been open, and I believe we're going on to six years now. Wow. Um, I've been answering all of your amazing questions on ants um, when you guys write to us at contact-us at antscanada.com But I do find that there are some common, I wouldn't say mistakes, but yeah, perhaps errors that might be setting back a lot of ant keepers from really enjoying the experience of a fruitful ant colony. And so this video is about the top 10 biggest mistakes in ant keeping. Alright, so the 10th biggest mistake in ant keeping I find is, now I know this is going to cause a lot of controversy, so I just want to get it out of the way. It really has been the center for a lot of heated debate. But in my opinion, the 10th biggest mistake is keeping and buying exotic ant species. In other words, species of ants that are not from your area, they're imported, often illegally. I, myself, and a lot of scientists out there are really against the practice of keeping exotic ants in the home as pets. And why do I feel like this is a big mistake? Well, other than being very dangerous for the environment and also fueling an illegal pet trade, it's a mistake because the ants often don't make it. You know, a lot of people dream of having that amazing fungus uh, growing, you know, Ada or Acromermex colony at home and they live in like a temperate region and they completely just order these exotic species from the web or wherever um, illegally too and the colony doesn't flourish. Moving here to the tropics from Canada, I can now appreciate why it doesn't work often because just the conditions are really hard to duplicate, um, especially for the really sensitive tropical species. Like my Asian weaver ants here, for example, they really flourish here in Philippines, in the wild, and it's kind of easy to keep them here indoors in my place um, because the temperature is right, the humidity is right, all of that, all those aspects are right. But even then, it's hard to duplicate the conditions outside. Now, I imagine bringing Asian weaver ants to say, I don't know, Canada, it would be no surprise to me that they wouldn't survive there. So if you guys can, learn to appreciate the native species from where you're from. It will really make your ant keeping experience so much easier. Oh, and also if you're looking for ants, be sure to check our GAN project on our website. More about that later at the end of this video as well. We hook up ant keepers who want to sell their colonies to local ant keepers who are looking for colonies. And at number nine, one of the biggest mistakes in ant keeping I find is the outworld setup. Now, what's an outworld? The outworld is that enclosure that you attach to your formicarium, which acts as the outer world, where your ants kind of go out and they forage and they bring food back into their nest, but also the garbage out there, and it serves quite a few functions, actually. The biggest mistake I find that a lot of ant keepers are doing is they're designing a very, very complicated and intricate outworld. Now, this is okay if you have a natural nest, because you could get as intricate as you want if you have a natural nest, that's fine. But if it's just an outworld without the formicarium attached into the outworld, um, you can run into some problems if you have too many plants and decorations and all of that sort of thing. Because the ants have more opportunity to hide. In effect, what happens is a lot of the ants move out of the formicarium and into the outworld, whether it be under rocks, in pieces of wood, in little nooks and crannies that you can't really see or get to. And also an overcomplicated outworld can lead to problems with cleaning. As you all may know, the ants use the outworld as a place to dispose of their garbage and create a graveyard. So you want all places of the outworld to be accessible so you can clean up all of that junk. And at number eight, in our biggest mistakes in ant keeping, we have the problem of a bad setup. A lot of you guys write to me saying how you're having problems with your ants, and I find that most of it is attributed to the setup. Now, I wanted to briefly go over 
the aspects of a very good formicarium. The ideal formicarium allows you to have a temperature and moisture gradient, so you have warm spots and cool spots. You've got moist spots and you have less moist spots. This allows your ant colony to kind of choose and thermoregulate and hydroregulate depending on what they prefer. An effective nest also has a good hydration system. You don't want a nest that dries out too quickly because it's quite the hassle to have to always add water. And let's say you forget to add water one day, your ants will dry out. But at the same time, you don't want a formicarium that you just water, say, once a week or once a month. Because if that's the case, it means that water is just cooling there and it's just a breeding ground for bacteria and harmful microbes that can harm your colony. For me, a formicarium that you water about two to four times a week is pretty good. Oh yeah, and I should mention that uh, your hydration routine depends on the species because if you have a dry loving species like say Messer or Pogonomirmex, um, you don't want to be watering too often. But if you have a say a Myrmica rubra colony that requires water constantly, well you have to water more often. Finally, you want a formicarium with good ventilation. If there's a lot of stagnant air in a formicarium, you're gonna get mold. So one way to get rid of that is a nest with good ventilation. Bad ventilation can happen when you don't have enough exits for the size of formicarium that you're using. So as a general rule, the bigger the formicarium, the more exits you should have. Unless of course you have a formicarium that kind of has ventilation spaces. Like our Omni nests are made of layers and believe it or not, air does go through there and through the little micro spaces at the top. Number seven is a big one. It's not hibernating your colony if you live in a temperate region. Now, again, there are a lot of people who say that it's not necessary to hibernate your ants, but it has been said that hibernating your colony helps prolong the life of the queen because it gives her a break from egg laying every year. But it's also kind of been my philosophy in ant keeping to, as much as possible, give temperate ants the opportunity to hibernate. Now, I've said this in previous videos of mine, um, and I've gone over the reasons why it's important to hibernate, but the general reason for me is that, um, well, you know, all animals run on cycles. For example, we humans, we wake up in the morning, we eat at specific times, um, you know, we go to the bathroom often at specific times, um, then we get sleepy in the night. This, of course, is the circadian cycle, which is monitored by our pineal gland in our brain, uh, based on light and there are always all of these sort of cycles in animals that control nearly everything like hormones and just really everything for me if you don't hibernate your ants I feel it kind of like interrupts that cycle you know ants for millions of years in wherever say Canada or USA or Europe they've evolved to hibernate year after year and if you remove that from their environment and living condition it kind of can screw up, in my opinion, their cycle. And most of the time, ants will go into a hibernation state anyways, even if you try to keep them warm and indoors. So might as well give them what they want, right? Um, I always say to learn to appreciate the amazing break that you guys are given from the ant keeping, because especially if you're keeping a lot of ants, um, I remember back in Canada, I used to love when hibernation came because it meant that I could just kind of sit back and take a break and store my ant colonies away for a good three months and um, not have to worry. And it kept ant keeping very, very fresh. Number six is also a big one that I often see in emails, and that is moving an ant colony into your formicarium too early. Now, if you're going to move a queen into a formicarium, it's always best that she has a big full army of workers to help her in this critical time when she's moving from her founding chamber to a larger nest. For me, I like to wait till there are at least about 20 workers. The more workers you can kind of culture, the better when you're moving the colony from a test tube setup to their formicarium. I find some people try moving their ants too early and the small colony fails to adapt to the large space and it often leads to the queen dying and all the workers dying. 
what you can do to make things easier is you can take your test tube setup, place it into an outworld world or like a small container or an aquarium and directly inside, remove the cotton um, and then feed the colony inside this container. Put your barrier at the top or what have you. And yeah, just place the food inside there and they can survive in there until the colony gets larger. And then when you have enough workers, you can then proceed to move them into your formicarium by attaching that container or outworld to your formicarium. And then eventually, you know, they'll move in. Moving on with our countdown for top 10 biggest mistakes in endkeeping is another big one that I find a lot of people uh, might have trouble with, and that is finding the best ratio for diet. Now, if you've watched our previous videos, you know that ants require uh, sugars, they require protein, and they require water. Your ants depend on you to provide them those three. So when a lot of people write to me saying they're having a problem with their colony, their colony's having issues with growing, or they're having some die-offs as well, um, and if their setup seems right, the next question I ask is, what's their diet like? Are you providing them water? Are you providing them sugars? Are you providing them enough insects for protein? If you guys haven't seen it yet, be sure to check out our ant nutrition tutorial here on this channel, and it can help you out with ideas on how to feed your ants properly. The number four mistake is keeping ants in an air-conditioned room. Now this is a big one. For those of you who have seen our ant video on thermal regulation and ants being cold-blooded, you know that they can't produce their own heat. Um, and so if they're kept in a cool air-conditioned room, the colony is going to grow a lot slower than, say, if they were kept warm. So if you're going to keep them indoors, what I like to do is I like to have an ant room. Um, and if you have herps, you know, herptiles or snakes, lizards, any other cold-blooded animals, you can keep them in that room because that room tends to be warm and the humidity tends to be higher. If you can keep all the ants in a single room and heat that room, that would be amazing. The way I used to achieve this when I lived in Toronto was I would kind of put tape on the central air conditioning ducts and let the sun stream in during the day so my room was boiling but the ants loved it. Now, if there's no way to do that and your ants absolutely have to be in an air conditioned room, of course it helps to have a heating cable. Um, they sell them at pet stores for heating reptiles um, and run it along one end of the formicarium. Um, and you can even put a spotlight in your outworld as well to kind of simulate the sun's heat. And the ants will really, really appreciate that. Now, number three is kind of a funny one because, you know, it's really, really easy to get excited, especially if it's your first time keeping ants. Um, and when you catch your queen, there's nothing like the thrill of, you know, setting up her test tube setup and just kind of putting her away and watching her create her colony. It really is fun and amazing, and I totally get that. But the problem with that is sometimes it disturbs the queen. Now, a queen that's disturbed or overly stressed out during this critical time when she's founding her colony will often not do well. Um, sometimes she'll eat her eggs, uh, sometimes she won't lay eggs. It just causes a lot of undue complications. So as much as possible, if you can, put your queen away in the dark, under some towels, in the depths of your closet somewhere, and just forget about her. Maybe, I don't know, check her once a week, once every two weeks if you can. Um, your test tube setup, if it's done properly, should be enough to be a good home for her during this period when she's raising her nanitics, her first generation of workers. Number two is kind of related to number three because um, it involves the excitement of catching queens. Now, I remember when I first started ant keeping and I discovered how thrilling it was and how easy it was to catch a queen. I would catch like, I don't know, like 34 queens in a single week. And it was just a little too much, I've discovered, because by the end of it, you have about 85 to 90% of them being fertilized and you don't know what to do with all of these colonies. Now this is excluding all of you people who are part of our GAN project. You GAN farmers out there who are selling ant colonies to people in your city. This, this is not you guys. But for the beginners who just want to keep ants 
as pets, I do recommend that you catch a few queens just in case one of the queens you've caught is unfertilized, but not to catch too much. I say in a summer, if you can, try to catch, I don't know, two or three of each species. And finally, our number one in the countdown for top biggest mistakes in ant keeping, it is not doing your research. This is really a big key here because, you know, like with keeping any pet, um, it really, really is important to do your research beforehand. Now, this doesn't include you guys who all of a sudden discover a queen and it's like, hey, I've caught a queen ant. I wonder how to keep it. Let's go online and search. That doesn't include you guys. But um, if you are wanting to get into ant keeping, of course, researching is the best, the, the, the best first step. Um, and for those looking for information, there is a plethora of information online. Um, of course, you can start with our website, antscanada.com. Be sure to click on our Getting Started uh, tab on our website and then Ant Care tab as well. Um, and of course, this YouTube channel, guys. I've got a long list of videos in our video tutorial playlist, um, and they can help you out. And there are a lot of great forums on the internet that can help you as well. Finally, if you guys want an all-inclusive source for information, we do sell a book. It's called The Ultimate Ant Keeping Handbook. It's very affordable, and it's a digital ebook. So you purchase the book and a link is sent to you and a link pops up where you can download the PDF file and it's got literally everything you need to know. It's got all the basics in there. Um, there's even an ant glossary, a very lengthy ant dictionary for those of you who uh, want to look up certain terms. Um, and I've also included a long list of the most commonly kept species and it's got, you know, their temperature preference, their hydration preference for best formicarium, details about their nuptial flight, when you can expect to find queens, their distribution, their habitat, all of that sort of good stuff is in there in the ant care section by species at the end of the book. All right, so this video has been pretty long now. Thank you so much for subscribing guys and for watching my videos and for supporting the Ants Canada Ant Store. This is Mikey Busto signing out. Thank you. Bye. My name is Rafael Sequia. I'm from Brasilia, Brazil. I'm a biologist and gen farmer for the gen project by Ants Canada. This here is one of my personal colonies, a fadal colony. It is four months old with over 100 workers with some newborns here on the left, as you guys can see, that just hatched yesterday. And as a biologist and ant keeper, I believe that the gen project is a really good way to connect people in your area that know about ants that keep ants you know like to learn more to share your experience with people and also a really good way to start new ant keepers to the hobby because you have a, a lot of gen farmers out there with very good prices and almost any kind of species so you can easily find again farmer in your near your area and get in touch with him start raising your own colony well I've been studying ants for almost eight years already here you guys can see my queen I don't know if it's if I can get a good catch but she, there it is I've been keeping ants for almost eight years and I believe that the Gantt project is a really uh, uh, ecological right way to to promote this hobby you know they have a lot of caring about not letting the ants escape and you know getting the ants for people who actually care about that not uh, actually to avoid any problems with law or biological problems is a really good way and very wise way to keep ants well I do have a lot of species when I started I didn't 
have a, uh, a favorite species, so I raise almost everything that I find here in Brazil. I have many Ponerini ants like Odontomachus, Brunel, I have Neoponera inversa, I have Ectatoma, and I I really like the project, I really like the the initiative that Mikey Bustos had. I've been keeping ants because of his videos on YouTube. And I'd like to to let the message that uh, here you guys can see they're eating one of my larvae that I just fed to them. As you guys can see, you guys can also see some soldiers wandering around. Here's the entrance. Well, what I'd like to say is that uh, Gant Project is a really good way to get in touch with ant keepers and get more knowledge about the ants. And I really think it's a good way to promote the hobby, especially here in Brazil. We have few people who actually raise insects as pets, like spiders, some have like scorpions, but few people raise ants here in Brazil. I hope the project keeps growing and if you, any of you guys from Brazil has any wish to raise a colony, get in contact with Mikey Bussos, he can send all the information to talk to me and get your own end colony. I also have Fadal Solenopsis for sale. And I if you guys have any doubt about raising ants or how to get your queens go to antscanada.com and you can learn much more about that and i guess this is it thank you guys good luck